Hello, and welcome to the Lewis L. Odette Family Lecture at St. Michael's Hospital. I'm Tim Rutledge, President and CEO of Unity Health Toronto. Thanks to all of you for joining us today. And a special thanks and welcome to our keynote speaker, Juha Kakinen, all the way from Finland. Also a very special thanks to the Odette family, leading lights in Canadian philanthropy for enabling St. Michael's Hospital to host this lecture series, now its eighth year, with the world's foremost experts on homelessness and mental health. St. Michael's Hospital was founded in the 1800s, along with its Unity Health sister institutions, St. Joseph's and Providence, it was founded by the Sisters of St. Joseph to care for people experiencing disadvantage. That legacy of social justice and health equity remains an integral part of who we are today. It's in our DNA. St. Michael's Hospital has made it a priority to find concrete solutions to homelessness and precarious housing in Canada. That's because we witness firsthand its impact on human lives every day in our emergency department, at our family health team clinics, in our neonatal intensive care unit, and right outside the doors of this hospital. We understand homelessness as a health crisis that can be prevented if we as a society recognize that decent and affordable housing is as essential to the health of our population as wholesome food, clean air, fresh water, and accessible health care. Our health care staff and scientists are on the front lines. They led the Canadian study that tested the housing first approach of which Juha Kakinen is one of the architects. Housing First understands that giving people who are homeless and struggling with a mental illness a home without preconditions. This is key to breaking the cycle of moving from hospitals to shelters to streets and back again. Its success has influenced the province of Ontario to set a goal to end chronic homelessness by 2025. When the COVID-19 pandemic hit Toronto last year, it brought the homelessness crisis into sharp focus for all of us. We saw just how vulnerable those who are homeless and living with a mental illness are to virus transmission and to serious health complications. So St. Michael's took action to provide them with safe and effective health care in the hospital and in the community. And now we are looking beyond the pandemic and working with partners across the city to find a permanent solution. It's a huge challenge. It's an amb ambitious goal, but it's one we'll stop at nothing to take on. And now, like you, I'm looking forward to hearing from our speakers and panelists. So now I'll turn over the event to our moderator, Emily Matthew, a journalist who has spent a great deal of time covering homelessness and precarious housing. Thank you, Tim. Today, we're thrilled to have Yuha Kakinen with us. Yuha has been working towards housing solutions and improved social welfare since the 1980s. He's the CEO of Finland's largest housing nonprofit, the Y Foundation, and one of the architects of the country's Housing First program. He'll be speaking to us about Finland's national plan to eradicate homelessness, how and why it succeeded, and after Yuha speaks, we will have a discussion of some of the issues with experts in homelessness and mental health on our panel, and we'll have time for some questions. Um, then after Yuha speaks, we're going to shift to a conversation, and then you know we'll have time for a few audience questions. A few housekeeping notes. You know, keep in mind that when you do post questions, please don't post any private information. Uh, we don't want that getting out in the world. And um, if you run into any technical difficulties, we have a tech support FAQ or support chat ready and waiting to help you out. You know, we're going to try to get to everyone's questions. If we miss you, um, I apologize. We'll follow up after the talk. Today's webinar is being recorded and you're going to get a link afterwards. And now please welcome our 2021 Lewis L. Odette Lecture keynote speaker, Yuha Kakinen. Thank you, Emily. First of all, I would like to thank the family and St. Thomas Foundation for the invitation to deliver this year's L. Louis Odette Family Lecture. This is both a great honor and privilege to me. My home country, 
Finland has been held in recent years as a country which has managed to decrease homelessness by implementing Housing First as a national policy. Nowadays, Housing First is being implemented in many countries, but in most countries, homeless, homelessness is still on the rise. So what explains this contradictory trend is the difference in the actual Housing First model or the way it has been implemented, or are there other external or environmental explanations for this? This is something I try to clarify in my presentation. As you can see, there is a longer trend in reducing homelessness in Finland. We have had several national programs since, two, since 1987, when we started to count homelessness in Finland. Housing First has been implemented as a national policy in 2008. And in 2012, the last big hostel in Helsinki was renovated into supported housing unit with independent apartments. In the last 10 years, homelessness has been almost halved and long-term homelessness has dropped by 65%. As you can see from the slide, there are also the, the goals that we try to reach in the coming years. We have a wide definition of homelessness, which includes also people living temporarily with friends and relatives. Actually, two thirds of our home, all homeless are people living in temporarily with friends and relatives. As the last survey from 2020 showed, we have 4,341 single homeless persons and around 200 homeless families living mainly in temporary accommodation. Outright rough sleeping is minimal and there are necessary emergency accommodation centers available. Uh, in our thinking, Housing First is based on permanent housing and for that reason we started in Finland the renovation and conversion of shelters and hostels into supporting housing units with independent apartments and on-site staff to provide support. This is probably the Finnish speciality in the international Housing First context. In 2008, we had in Helsinki around 600 bed places in shelters and hostels. Now there is one permanent service center for emergency use with 52 bed places. There are obvious reasons why we wanted to get rid of shelters and hostels. In our thinking and statistics, people living in temporary accommodation are still homeless. It is not a permanent solution and doesn't provide a foundation for your life and recovery. It seems that in many big cities, rough sleeping is related to shelters and hostels being offered as the main option for homeless people. It is not a surprise that many homeless people even prefer to sleep rough instead. This renovation was supported by state grants for the actual construction work and also during the program period from 2008 to 2015 by state grants to hire new support workers in the supported housing units. This has been a big positive transformation, for example, for a formerly very traditional organization like Salvation Army, which is now one of the most progressive organizations in the field, for example, with their employment programs. Vainala, which is a building that my foundation constructed in 2014, is, is an ex excellent example of these new supported housing units. It consists of 33 independent apartments, but there are also common, common premises, uh, living rooms, etc. And there are on-site staff provided by the Salvation Army to provide support for those, those who need support but people have their own rental contracts and they can live totally independently or take part in the community actions if they prefer to do that. 
The basic principles of our housing first are very similar to the original Broadway's housing first model that Dr. Semperis developed in, in New York in, in the 1990s. But we probably highlight more the idea of normality or what's considered ordinary in the society. This is maybe best illustrated in our idea of the tenant's role and responsibilities. As a tenant, a former homeless person has the same rights and obligations as everybody else in the same situation. So he, she is expected to pay the rent, for example. If he doesn't have enough income, he can get the general housing benefit and social welfare benefit as everybody else in the same situation. Uh, I have said that you can't have housing first without having housing first. In our national program, which started in 2008, we had clear concrete goals, how many apartments were needed and how cities and NGOs taking part in the program were supposed to acquire them. So besides building new supported housing units, we have got small apartments from different sources, even by buying them from private market. Uh, this scattered housing is still the main option for, for our ho housing in Housing First. And for example, the organization where I work, my foundation has been doing this buying flats from the private market for, for over 30 years already. Also to support arrangements, we, we consider that they must be flexible. We don't have a fixed multi-professional team. Our support is based on intensive case management and services provided by the basic social and health services. Uh, we understand very well that the original model, which had this assertive community treatment or multi-professional team, is extremely important and well-functioning for, for people who have mental, mental health issues. But we also think that this is something that needs to be developed according to the current needs. And I think, for example, that if somebody was inventing housing first at the moment, one person that should be included in the, in the working group certainly would be some form of IT or digital, digital support because that's so important at the moment to be included in the, in the society. I think that we have managed to introduce a systemic change from a traditional staircase model that tried to manage homelessness into a system which genuinely aims to end homelessness. This would not have been possible without the culture of collaboration uh, we have between state authorities, cities and NGOs, both on the national and local level. And I also couldn't understand overestimate the role of affordable social housing, both in preventing homelessness and as a route out of homelessness. Our present government has set an even more ambitious goal to reach absolute zero homelessness by 2027. I think that this is realistic. It is realistic to reach a functional zero of homelessness where there is no long-term homelessness and a very low level of temporary or episodic homelessness. But certainly to reach that, we have some domestic issues to solve before. But it's also extremely encouraging that the new mayor of Helsinki has set even more strict timeline for the zero point by 2025. I'm sure that the affordable social housing stock will play a crucial role in this process. Actually, in Finland, we build yearly twice the amount of affordable housing compared to the number of homeless people. So 
What explains the Finnish success of, and why there has not been similar development elsewhere? In most countries, in my experience, housing first has been implemented as individual projects, although there are now encouraging development of upscaling in countries like Scotland and France. But if temporary accommodation is still the main option, it is more than probable that the role of housing first remains residual, one service model among others. For us, housing first has acted as a catalyst which made it possible to accomplish the transformation of shelters and hostels. But there is also a certain path dependency behind this change of the paradigm and systemic change. There are ne several necessary factors contributing sufficient legal framework, including adequate social security, sub supply of affordable social housing, but most of all, a culture of collaboration which made a rap rather rapid implementation of the system change possible. But finally, I think we have to consider also the role of politics and politicians. All this wouldn't have started and happened without individual politicians with social consciousness. But it is another thing how an originally a political initiative by a politician could turn into a wider political consensus. Since 2008, we have had eight different coalition governments in Finland with up from two to six parties in, in each of the governments, which means that all the parties in the present government have at some point been in the government and decided that national programs and homelessness will be continued. So is the reason for this kind of political consensus because homelessness, after all, is a small scale social problem and concrete results can be achieved within a political mandate? Or is it because, as I maybe a little naively or idealistically think, because ending homelessness by providing decent housing is seen in our so society, not only as a human right in legal sense, but more as a question of human rights and human value based on ethical justification and moral obligation. It is a question of decency and, and dignity. And it is possible to end homelessness. Thank you for your attention. Hi, uh, Yuha, thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Uh, it's incredible. I know that people are going to have a lot of questions. Uh, first, just before we even get started, I think what we wanted to ask you if there's any way you can explain to us um, in sort of a compressed version, how it was that you actually made this happen? Well, I think that uh, there are things that I tried to touch upon in my presentation, but if I would make a short list of what's needed to, to make things really happen. I think that, of course, there's the, the need for political will, political will that leads to action. So you need decisions, you need commitment. Uh, but most of all, I think what was important in Finland was the wide collaboration between the state, municipalities and NGOs. That kind of, I think that we have that kind of culture of collaboration uh, we have had it for quite a long time already. And I think that it, it creates the foundation for this kind of systemic change that we try to introduce. And, and mainly, I think that we all also managed to do it. No, uh, of I'm... course, the housing first plays an important role, but these are the other things that are needed to introduce it. No, I think it's I think it's amazing. So I think that a, a really big part of sort of the barriers to housing that we all know and see is that we don't have a lot of blueprints that are easily available for how it can be done. So it's really exciting to see your work. I know we're gonna get more into that, but first I'm gonna introduce the rest of the panel. So we've got Terry Alley. He's an outreach worker at St. Michael's Slate Family Emergency Department. 
Before, he was an addiction peer support specialist in the Emerge, which is pretty, you probably saw some amazing stuff. Dr. Oh, yeah. Jim Dunn is a scientist at MAP Center for Urban Health Solutions at St. Mike's. He's also a professor and chair of the Department of Health, Aging and Society, and director of the McMaster Institute for Healthier Environments at McMaster University, where you hold the Senator William McMaster Chair in Urban Health Equity. Welcome panelists. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I think, you know, obviously we're hoping for some audience questions, but I think we're going to start right off with Terry. Um, Terry, just I wanted to get a sense, you know, obviously you've had lived experience and I wanted to just ask you what having a home, a safe place to call home, allowed you to accomplish and what it meant for the trajectory of your life. Thank you for the question. Um, having a home meant everything to me. Actually, just saying home was an absolute wonderful thing for me to be able to heal, to have somewhere that I felt as though I belonged. And uh, coming out of treatment and being able to have somewhere that I could build a community, somewhere that I could uh, establish myself, establish my roots, and not feel like I was outside of society, but actually becoming a part of society. The great thing about having a home it was, there was no expectation put on me that there was these um, requirements for me to have that. I was fortunate uh, when I got housed. I got the little ticket here. Uh, it was February 13th, 1990. I've been there ever since. I, I love my apartment. I love the fact that, uh, that I was able to build it decorate it, paint it, loving it, crying it, growing it, invite my child into it. And it's really what helped me heal. And then it helped me build a foundation where I use my lived experience uh, to my advantage. My lived experience no longer defines me. One one of my top three favorite panel answers of all time. Um, please hold up that tiny card while I ask you the second or follow-up question. <laughs> I mean, you immediately talked about, you know, lived experience. And I wanted to hear a little bit about what you're seeing on the ground with the people that you're trying to help find housing and services now. Yeah, um, I don't know what's happened. Um, maybe I was naive back when I was... Um, able to find housing or I was directed in the, in the direction of fine housing. I, I really don't know what's happening now, why it's so difficult. Uh, there is housing out there, but it's, it's hidden. And the system isn't set up in a way where uh, the average frontline worker can find what's available. Uh, okay, so there isn't enough stock, that's a given, but there's gotta be a, an easier way for us to navigate the people that we work with to figure out who's got the stock, who's got this, what's the program to get people into it. And uh, I find that a bit frustrating. I, I'm fortunate to have worked, to be working with colleagues now that are far more knowledgeable than I am at being able to navigate those things. But I wonder about what the uh, all the other facilities where they're not able to have the people that I work with who can help find housing and, and, no, and, and provide and seek for others. I mean, what you're expressing is, I think, a frustration that um, a lot of journalists and a lot of people who work or are close to people working on the ground have been saying is just this sense of frustration, like you're kind of running into a bit of a brick wall. And if people didn't have people like you to help navigate those systems, I think it would be next to impossible. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to flip over to Jim for a minute because I wanted to ask him a little bit about sort of what we stand to lose. I mean, by not addressing the housing situation straight on, what is a nation fiscally, socially, morally, um, what's at stake? Well, <clears throat> thanks for that question, Emily. I think uh, one of the big things, of course, is there is a fiscal component to this. We know that it's very costly to maintain people in homelessness. It's actually 
we spend an enormous amount of money to provide services so that people can maintain their homelessness, which is actually kind of uh, unusually illogical, right? That we should actually be doing something to address their housing needs. And that, however, requires a coordination of activities across sectors that is challenging to do. So it's not that we don't know what to do. We actually do know what to do, but we need to better implement it and figure out a way to be able to coordinate those things across sectors. So, and I also want to emphasize, though, that beyond just the fiscal aspect of this, right, that it could on paper at least save money, is that there's a human rights component to this as well. And I think it's really important that we emphasize that. So, you know, the UN Declaration on Human Rights does recognize housing as one of 30 human rights. And our own federal legislation that is enacted, enacted the National Housing Strategy, includes a commitment to human rights, that housing is a human right as well. And this is really important because there are many groups for whom housing is actually very difficult to obtain who won't save the system money, who won't actually create these kinds of fiscal economies. I think about people with developmental disabilities, for example, they will cost more money, but do they have a right to housing as much as anyone else? People with severe mental illness, addictions and so forth? Absolutely they do. So we do need a real uh, uh, change in our approach to this. And it has to be more than just in the dollars and cents. It has to be really under uh, underpinning those uh, human rights. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think uh, dignity is one of the most important pieces when we talk about housing. And I think Terry expressed a lot of that beautifully, just talking about what it meant to him and to have a home. Just to follow up when we're talking about capacity, I mean, you know, this is one of the questions I know, you know that I wanted to ask you about, like, does Canada have the ability to do this? Or is there a way to say yes or no? And I know that we have a national strategy, but we've all been watching it over the years. And I mean, we're still in dire need of affordable housing stock. So what can we do differently? <laughs> Yeah, I think this particular issue is is a little bit separate from the overall affordable housing stock. Absolutely. The affordable housing stock questions is a scaling problem of, you know, many hundreds of thousands of units. But in terms of specific cities in in this region, Toronto uh, and others, we could find the units. It's actually about coordinating the units and the subsidies for the housing and the supports that's actually the challenge. And, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, so yes, we can do it. Is the, is the underlying question. Do we have specific challenges? Without question. And I'll give you an example. Uh, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to meet uh, a man named Rajiv, Rajiv Shah, who was the uh, state commissioner for public health in New York State at the time. And I asked him, what are your two most important priorities? And one of them was supported housing. And I went, what? Like, why is that your priority? You're the state commissioner for public health. And he said, oh, it's a no brainer. He says, I run the state Medicare and Medicaid budgets. And it costs this much to keep somebody in a hospital bed, this much in a jail, this much in a shelter, this much in a long-term care facility, and this much in supported housing. And it was a much lower number. And he said, it's it's a matter of dollars and cents. The thing is that he controlled that entire envelope. So any savings that were created by putting in, uh, by giving someone a supported housing uh, slot were actually realized by him, by the same system. So what we have now is a, a, a real set of, of, of uh, silos that make it difficult for the savings that might be realized by providing supported housing to be realized by the health sector, to be realized by policing, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I definitely know that you and I are going to want to come back to that because I should say I have also have a bit of a frustration with silos because I know that we've had these numbers in front of us for a considerable period of time, people on the ground working themselves to dust to try to resolve these problems, but everyone is still operating in silos. Um, but I did want to go back to Yuha because there was a, a question I was really keen to ask about. So in Toronto, a lot of what they've been trying to do to help some of the most marginalized people, you know, people that have been unfortunately, you know, forced to encamp in local parks. Um, we've been trying to expand our emergency shelter system. And the approach that you took was not to expand that system, but to eliminate the shelter system. And can you explain a little bit to me or to us just about why you took that approach? For the very simple reason that shelter is not a permanent solution to homelessness. I think that authorities, authorities have the, the tendency to increase shelter capacity when they really don't know what to do and they want to show that they are doing something. But but if you ask people with lived experience of homelessness if they want shelters, I think that most of them say that no. It's, it's almost like the same thing that you went to hospital with a broken bone and then you were Somebody would stick a band aid on on your <laughs> on your phone and and say that that's it. It's it's not solving the issue. And the the the, the bad thing with shelters is that they are meant to to be a temporary solution. 
but I have a very personal experience from from Helsinki that temporary solutions with with shelters they they become more or less permanent. In 1980s, I was responsible for for building a, a very modern shelter in, in in Helsinki, and I was told that it will stay temporary for a couple of winters, but it was temporary for over 20 years. So that's exactly what happens. And there's no scientific truth that how much you need emergency shelters. You can always increase them. And this is the big change that has to be done that to move from, from temporary accommodation into, into permanent housing. And, and for that, Housing First is an excellent catalyst for to make this change. Yeah, I have one more really big question for you before we throw into the Q&As. And this, this definitely ties to the idea of emergency shelter. I mean, we know that with climate change, there's going to be and continues to be a tremendous shift of people who will rely on emergency shelters. And I just wanted to hear your thoughts a little bit about sort of the challenges that are posed to us globally when it comes to providing housing uh, when we think about climate change. Well, I think that we, we all know that climate, climate change is real and there is a real possibility of climate refugees also. Uh, but I think that it's not either or. We we have to find a solution to solve both the present and future challenges together. And at the same time, we need housing to solve homelessness. But it is possible to build in a, in a climate-wise way also to increase carbon handprint and decrease carbon footprint, even to offer job opportunities at, at the same time for, for former homeless persons. So. We have to think big enough to to solve these issues, and and still homelessness compared to many other issues is is a it, it's it's a strange thing to say that it's it's a it's a small and and simpler issue. We know the answers, we know the solutions. It's only as Tim so right, rightly said, it's a question about implementation, and so so we have to stress that more. Well, no, I mean, and this is again, you know, why I'm so excited about talking about your example as a blueprint, because we know that there's a series of pressures that are coming that's going to make homelessness not just something that, you know, applies to say a small percentage of society, but is going to be the lived reality for more and more yeah. people. So we need to start thinking about how we're going to be housing everybody together. Um, we do actually have a few questions that the audience have posted, as well as, um, you know, we've got some general Q&A. So I think we're going to flip over to that for a minute. Yuha, thank you for answering <laughs> um, the biggest question of the century, but um, it's really great to get your insights on that. I wanted to go back to Terry just for a minute. Um, Terry, we sort of started to touch into the idea of mental health supports and how essential it is for people who may be dealing with um, substance use disorder or you know, managing a, a mental health issue. And can you just speak to a bit about how important those supportive services are in addition to having a home? Yes, thanks again for the question. Um, having a home, uh, I mean, was absolutely essential for me to start to heal. And I would imagine that's for most of the folks that are experiencing what they're experiencing, not having a home. But so many people who we work with, so many people who we encounter, and in my previous role, they're dealing with severe issues, severe substance abuse issues or severe mental health issues. First thing is if you're able to house these folks and find permanency for them, <clears throat> then building a system around them that could help them figure out how they would like to address their mental health issues or their substance use issues, rather than us imposing what that looks like to them, they're surviving with those issues. They know themselves better than anyone else. But to not have those issues around and just kind of hope everything works out, sorry, to not have those resources around and hope that everything works out, rarely does. This is where you see people cycling through the system over and over. If those resources and those supports are built in, then you're going to have people making really good choices, healthy choices for themselves. And you're going to find that these folks just reintegrate themselves back into our society. No, I mean, again, I think one of the, the best things that sort of struck with me in one of your first questions is you talked about community. And there's a, a really big difference between finding someone, one of those isolated units, you know, putting them into housing and hoping for the best. And if people are already struggling or feeling isolated, 
we know that it's not going to work. So it's important to sort of not just give somebody four walls, but make sure that they're safe, secure, have access to medical supports. Um, I'm gonna try to dig into some of the audience questions here. And I think that I'm gonna try Jim on this one. So just to go back to the policy piece, I mean, you know, they're asking basically, um, you know, has someone done a cost comparison of Toronto's shelter programs versus a more permanent solution? Yes, they have. Um, you know, it, it may be a great tool for us to move forward. Is there a, a current paper or a current number or something you think that even the public might be interested in reading in or sinking their teeth into to try to get a bit of a better idea? Um, well, I think, you know, my understanding is that the way things are now, that basically if someone is in a shelter for more than 180 days, then mm -hmm. that's housing. And so you can essentially scale your shelter system to that number. So essentially there, you know, the shelter system does perform an important function. There are people who do temporarily need help and then they get a bit of help and then they go on and, and they never need it again. But it, the challenge we have is that a, a lot of the people who need permanent supported housing solutions end up in the shelter system and, and, and other and homeless in the street and so forth and get stuck there. In terms of the number, there's different estimates. Uh, the at home Chez Soi study, which was a study that was conducted by the Mental Health Commission of Canada and the Toronto site was actually led by scientists uh, from St. Michael's Hospital and the MAP Center for Urban Health Solutions, Stephen Wong and Vicky Sturgiopoulos were the, were the leads there. Uh, it showed that uh, for every dollar invested in supported housing for people of high needs, there were costs avoided in other sectors that totaled $15. That's one of the estimates that they came up with. So the potentially the ROI is actually very high on this. The return on investment is very high on this. The challenge is, all, it's going to be hard to detect those differences because all those other sectors are oversubscribed to begin with, right? So it's not like suddenly if you reduce emergency department visits by a big investment in supported housing, emergency departments are going to stop being busy. Of course, going to be they're still going to be busy, right? And they're still going to appear busy, but they won't be dealing with as many of those uh, challenges that could easily be solved in other ways. And of course, the, the, the clients would benefit, of course, because they wouldn't have to go into crisis in order to get help. And so sure. I think that's, you know, there's a lot of issues related to that, but definitely on paper, at least, there's the possibility to save money. So I'm going to try to weave a question into sort of a bit of a comment here. Um, and I'm, I'm going to take this back to Yuha. So somebody is basically commenting realistically on the fact that, you know, current Ontario federal supports for people who may have be on Ontario Works or maybe dealing with disability, the rates are incredibly low compared to the actual cost of housing. And in Finland, when you were sort of working towards this new model, is there a comparative structure or was the funding in place that just allowed people to have the home? Or could you? Yes, I think that this is an important component of, of the whole system that we have a social security system where you, for example, have general housing benefits. So basically, if you don't have any income, you can get housing benefit that can cover 80% of, of your rental costs. Okay. So that's, of course, extremely important also in, in preventing people from dropping into, into homelessness. So, so th there shouldn't be so much economic reasons for people to drop into, into homelessness. And... Of course, there's also the the social welfare benefit system existing, and I think that these are necessary components of, of the of the total total policy to to address homelessness. Also, as somebody who's had a really you know top bird's eye view of the whole policy system, when people actually need to access that funding for housing, has in your experience has it been a simple process? Or has it been a long, drawn out, possibly overly complex? Has it been easy to get the money, I would say? Has Finland put a system uh, in place that makes it easy? Yeah, yes, it, I think it's it's pretty simple system. So I, I don't, of course, there can be individual cases where you meet bureaucratic challenges to prove something, but but as a, as a general system, it, it has functioned fairly well. And of okay. course, I would like to, point out the importance of prevention. We have not spoken about prevention and, and there are several elements, of course, the social security is one element, but of course the affordable housing 
<laughs> is probably the most important structural element of preventing homelessness. And for that reason, we don't have in, in Finland actually family homelessness at all. You know, we're a little bit of schedules ahead of schedule. So if you want to take two minutes and talk a little bit more about another key item of prevention, please do. So, Well, uh, I would say something about uh, the affordable housing in Finland because it's an important policy. So in each new housing area in the big cities, there's always at least 25% of affordable housing, social housing. It's rental housing. It's good quality. You don't, you can't make the difference between private and 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 this sub state subsidized social housing when you go around in, in the housing areas. So I think that this is this explains, of course, quite a lot. You can't have this. I think that housing first is the best solution we have to solve homelessness. But you can't have housing first if you don't have the housing available. You know those. So that's, those those numbers of units, is that something that's done in partnership with private development in Finland, or is that something that the government takes the reins and handles on their own? Well, this is the thing that you, you can't rely on, on on the private investors in, in, in real estate to, to provide enough affordable housing. And, and for that reason, uh, the state, together with the municipalities, kind of guarantees that we, we have a decent amount of supply of affordable social housing for people with, with low incomes. I am going to actually tackle one of these questions. Thank you for that answer. I'm going to tackle one of these questions on my own. Um, someone is saying, how do you address the issue of fairness when you take into consideration people who are keeping a roof over their heads by working more than one job and accessing food banks and not receiving any help? It's a valid question, but I would turn around and ask that individual to take a better look at some of the social safety nets that may have supported them in their life or some of the nets that may have failed people who find themselves in, in moments of crisis or moments of struggle. So the idea of fairness, I don't think, is something that you can really apply. There's not really a level playing field to start. And I think that the more we can talk about and the more we can educate people on those various layers, I think the better, which is why I love conversations like this. Um, I'm going to flip back to Terry because I feel like I've been leaving you alone for too long. Terry, do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, how you think that we can engage the public or how it is that you think that we can, you know, get the rest of the public on board with understanding what a critical issue this is for social health overall? Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, I was funny, I was thinking about this on the way down here today, and I was wondering, um, how do you, is homelessness invisible? Uh, well, it isn't to those of us that are working uh, on the front lines, seeing it all the time. But I took the taxi down here today, and it was driving down the street. There was all sorts of people that my eyes could catch that were without homes. And then I wondered how many of the other people walking by couldn't see them they were just invisible and it's not that they were invisible because they were invisible it's just maybe it's not out there enough maybe there needs to be some sort of campaign to let folks know that some of these people that are out there their uh, kids their neighbors their family members their brothers their sisters their husbands their wives just regular folks that are experiencing this really tragic thing. They don't have a place to call home. I don't know what the answer is, but maybe a public kind of a campaign to put a face to people, to put a, a name and a, a story to, you know, this person was probably succeeding in life and life got really complicated. And now here they are and they're invisible. Now we pass folks all the time that are invisible and I, I don't know if I have an answer. I just, I wish there was a way to identify how how tragic it is to not have a home and that they're just everyday people, just other human beings that we want to be able to invite back into their own lives, into our lives, to enrich this beautiful city that we live in, this world that can support all of this stuff. That, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question, but I was thinking about this on the way down here today. Uh, that was an incredible answer to a very abstract question. So thank you very much. And the humanity is the most important part. And I think a lot of times when people are talking about housing issues, we get lost in 
dollars and numbers and units and and benefits and and everything else. But I mean, at the core of all of this, there's a lot of people who are profoundly struggling. And I think probably everyone on this panel agrees that we have an obligation as human beings to help them um, live better lives. Okay, we've got about five more minutes and I'm going to see if there's any more audience questions that I wanna dig into here. Actually, Yuha, here's one for you. How did Finland actually, once the housing was built, how did you maintain and sustain those units? Or, you know, it's obviously got to be sort of a long-term project, so it's not just moving somebody in. What do you do? Well, uh, we changed the system in 2008. And since then, we have been providing, I think, housing for around for 5,000 people who have been living in, 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 in homelessness. And we have used all possible housing options that are available. Social housing stock. We have been buying apartments from from the private market. Okay. We have built new supported housing. So all possible ways to get the housing needed. And it's mainly, of course, kept up with the the municipalities. The cities have the main responsibility to take care of this. Yeah, I know. I mean, I know that we, um, our federal government has started, you know, working on an acquisition strategy to, you know, take, I guess, um, to take as many assets as they can off the public market before they're, you know, sucked up by real estate investment corporations or, you know, hold on to affordable stock. And hopefully that's something that, you know, we do um, at the municipal and federal level. I'm going to just forgive me while I'm scanning through. There's actually quite a few questions. So I'm just scrolling through to see. I mean, obviously we've touched on shelters being a band-aid. We talked about sort of a bit of a pipeline. I mean, maybe just again, you have one more time. I mean, is there room for any cluster of emergency shelter in terms of say, like when we talk about pipeline issues, because you know, there's obviously going to be a waiting list for any kind of housing. So how does that fit in or how do you address that issue? Where do people stay until you can get them into the housing? Well, Actually, we, we renovated several of the former hostels or shelters in, into supported housing. And of course, we had a plan when we were closing some place, we moved people to independent apartments and, and to other new supported housing housing units. And you, you need to have a plan to, to replace the, the capacity that you are losing when, when you renovate something. The, Good example was the Salvation Army unit where they had 250 bed places and it was renovated into supported housing where everybody has an independent flat and they have now 81 independent flats and on-site staff to provide support in, in, in that building. So several things can be done. I have, a, I think the last question is still for you because I just wanted to ask about road bumps. I mean, we, we talked about climate change and challenges for the future. Just when you're doing this and you're, you're you're leading this work along the way, what are the biggest roadblocks or what are some of the biggest challenges that you've run into and how did you overcome them? Well, I think that the, probably the biggest challenge has been that because we have seen numbers going down in, in statistics, people think that it goes on its own. You don't have to do anything any, anymore. That's homeless and just goes on dropping and then that's not true because it's becoming more and more difficult because now the biggest group of homeless people we have are people living temporary with friends and relatives. So there are a lot of different issues now we are facing instead of having to deal with chronic homelessness that was the, the, the former target group of our, our programs. No, I mean, absolutely. I mean, and, and we talk in the city a lot about hidden homelessness, the idea that it's not so much people you see on the street or using the shelters, yeah. people staying with friends, people staying with an abusive partner, um, you know, staying in places they don't want to be, but they don't really have a choice. Um, this conversation could go on for an incredibly long time, but I think is now um, basically my you know job to say thank you so much to our incredible panelists. And I'm going to be passing it over to Lou Odette. Thank you, Emily. So I'd like to, uh, on the behalf of the PNL Odette Foundation and the Odette family, I'd like to thank you all for all the time and effort he's put into this uh, tremendous presentation today, and also all the time that he's uh, agreed to invest in talking to the Toronto media. Um, 
to help them uh, get his perspective on this. And uh, finally, I'd like to thank um, Emily, Terry, and Jim for helping us bring the Toronto perspective to this discussion here today. And, uh, and lastly, of course, to everybody who's Zoomed in and watched this, uh, this talk today. Thank you all. And um, I will pass it off to Lily Litwin, the president of the St. Michael's Foundation. Lou, I'm so glad you and your family could join us today. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lily Litwin, president of St. Michael's Foundation. What an extraordinary discussion today. It gives me hope that we can imagine an end to homelessness and its terrible impact on human lives. A, ho a home without preconditions, that's compassion. Treating housing as a human right and restoring people's dignity, that's a society in which everyone has the greatest chance to thrive. Creating an equitable healthcare system, that's how we can build hope for the future. And that's what we at St. Michael's are on a mission to achieve. So all Canadians get the health care they deserve, no matter their life circumstances. Thank you, Yuha, Terry, Jim, Emily, and Tim for such an enlightening conversation. And a big thanks to the Odette family. The extraordinary generosity of the Odette family, beginning with Louis L. Odette, has made so many innovations possible at St. Michael's Hospital. The Odettes have a remarkable track record of giving to build a stronger community and empowering others to make Toronto a place where people from all walks of life can live well. We are so fortunate that they've chosen to support vital initiatives at St. Michael's that not only build awareness like this afternoon's lecture, but seed programs that tackle Toronto's homelessness crisis and that can change the healthcare system to benefit everyone. To all of you, thank you for joining. Please stay in touch with St. Michael's. We have some exciting events coming up around the corner, and we'd love to see you again. Thank you all.